Son and to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, our true High Priest, make us worthy to commemorate the bishops and the priests who have passed from this life. They cared for your flock, they served at your altars and celebrated your holy mysteries. May they share in the heavenly reward of the faithful bishops and priests, that with them they may sing glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father who chose priests, and to the Son who entrusted the service of his mysteries to them, and to the Holy Spirit who sanctified their offerings. To the good one be glory and honor on this day of their blessed commemoration and all the days of our lives and forever. Glory and thanks to you, O High Priest, our Lord Jesus Christ, for your priesthood is eternal. This day we recall our faithful bishops and priests who have finished their service and who have departed from this world. How precious in your eyes is the death of your righteous ones. They carried you in their hands and they invited your people to your holy banquet. They proclaimed your word and your gospel and they diligently cared for your flock. Now, O Lord, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to receive them and forgive them for any shortcomings in their service. As you honor them in this life, clothe them with the glory of your priesthood and with the robe of the righteous in the sanctuary of your apostles Peter and Paul, who faithfully served you. Count them among the children of light in the church of the firstborn. May they enjoy the graces of your holy mysteries that they once celebrated in the company of the blessed of prophets, apostles, bishops, and priests. With them they raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
O Lord, accept our prayers and the fragrance of our incense. And may the priests who have celebrated your holy mysteries and who have departed from us receive the reward of the good and faithful servant. In the abundance of your grace, forgive their sins and remember on your heavenly altar all the good things they once offered to you. May they share in the reward of all your saints, and with them may we raise glory and thanks to you forever. Adi Shantaluho, Kodi Shant, Hayalatono, Kodi Shant, and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of faith and of the second sound teaching you have followed. Avoid profane and silly myths. Train yourself for devotion, for while physical training is of limited value, devotion is valuable in every respect, since it holds a promise of life both for the present and for the future. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. For this we toil and struggle because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the savior of all, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one have contempt for your youth, but set an example for those who believe in speech conduct, love, faith, and purity. Until I arrive, attend to the reading, exhortation, and teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was conferred on you through the prophetic word with the imposition of hands of the Presbyterian. Be diligent in these matters, 
be absorbed in them so that your progress may be evident to everyone. Attend to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in both tasks, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and to those who listen to you. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Shlomo Elokolechuna From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke who proclaim life unto the world let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls The Lord Jesus says, Who then is the faithful and prudent steward whom the master will place in charge of his servants to distribute the food allowance at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master upon his arrival finds doing so. For truly I say to you, he shall, be pla he shall place him in charge of all his property. But if that servant says within himself, my master is long delayed, and then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and to drink and to get drunk, then that servant's master shall come on an unexpected day and at an unknown hour, and he will punish him severely and assign him a place among the unfaithful. That servant who knew his master's will, but did not make preparations, nor act in accord with his will, shall be beaten severely. And the servant who was ignorant of his master's will, but who acted in a manner deserving of a severe beating, shall be beaten only lightly. Much will be demanded of the man entrusted with much, and still more shall be demanded of the man entrusted with more. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and Do not neglect the grace you have received. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 
So we know from our catechism, we speak about God as being unchanging, immutable. But it doesn't mean that in unchangingness that God just sits there inert. It's important for us to understand that God is the living one, the communication. He is continually communicating. The act of creation, the fact that you have air to breathe at this very instant is because God is speaking. That speaking is in the act of creation. He gives us air. He gives us everything that is around us. That is a continual communication. When we speak about him unchanging, again, it doesn't mean he's inert, but it means that he is the fulfillment of infinite perfection. He is simply existence. But that communication we know even more clearly because he has revealed himself in his word, in his son. And that incarnation that we've celebrated over these last weeks with the Epiphany and this coming Thursday is the Feast of the Presentation, the 40th day of Christmas. This whole aspect of communication is God is always reaching out to us continually. And as we've often considered the fact, the major thing about this is how we respond. How whether or not we're good conversationalists. We've talked often in the fact that the, the ability to converse, to communicate back and forth, is a talent and a skill. It has to be trained in us when we're little, to learn how to listen, to learn how to respond. So it's not just the question of anger when someone will turn around and just walk away and ignore someone. It's also a bad conversationalist can also not hear the voice of God. That conversation is what we call our prayer life. Whether or not we are receptive, whether we respond, we see our prayer life so often as being in one direction. We just tell God things. But that's really not what prayer is. Prayer is mostly about being able to hear and to respond to that continual communication that is given. And so we come to the beginning of these three weeks of the commemoration of those who have passed beyond this world. To say the three weeks of the dead sounds a little morose. But it's that we commemorate in these three weeks those who have left this world, who have gone beyond the veil. And the very first week we have of deceased priests. This is one of the greatest and most attractive aspects, in my personal opinion, of Beit Marun. We have an entire week dedicated to priesthood of those men from generation to generation who've dedicated their entire lives. Because of course priesthood is not a job. Priesthood is not something that you just do on a side. It is your existence transformed, for better or for worse. Of him who has given much, much will be demanded. And of him who has received more, more will be demanded. And that aspect of the gospel that we have today in the commemoration of this week of priests, you'll notice by the reading that we have of the epistle, what it's focused on is what is priesthood? Priesthood is clearly about the divine mysteries. But you can't receive the divine mysteries if you're not listening, because you're not disposed. You know, St. Pius X at the beginning of the 20th century as Pope, he said that the greatest solicitude for the pastor is the church. Now, not the community of people. He was at this point in the, what he was talking about in his allocution. This is the building. Is it beautiful? Is it clean? Is it disposed in the way? Because he says it's there in that place that souls are disposed to receive the divine sacraments and to hear the word of God. So is the very ambiance of the place conducive to that conversation, to hear the one who desires to communicate to us? So yes, so when we talk about priesthood, priesthood is about the divine mysteries. But the divine mysteries require a disposition and a preparation beforehand. That preparation is going to come to us in our catechesis. It's going to come to us in hearing the word of God, of course. It comes to us in teaching. When we talk about the ability to pray, the priests are also meant to lead the flock. They're supposed to have learned themselves the path and then to lead in the flock also how to pray how to converse with the unchanging one, the one who speaks in his word. So we see again and again in each of these aspects, even in guiding, 
When we talk about the priesthood, the priesthood is sanctifying. The priesthood is also meant to teach and to govern. But if you'll notice that in Christianity, all of them actually come to the center part, which is teaching. You can't be sanctified if you don't know diddly squat about the gospel. You have to hear the word of God. You have to know something about it. It's why we have tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of Catholics who are really kind of clueless, just wandering through the world because they weren't really taught. Doesn't mean they're evil, doesn't mean they're demonic. It just means they weren't taught. And it means then that for us, the priests who are meant to be the teachers in the house of God, we go to hell because we have failed in our duty of state. So yes, now that I've been here for five years, you're used to the 20 minute sermon, sometimes half an hour. In the old days, they used to be 40 minutes back in the 90s, but that's really, we're, we're old now, 30 years later, so we can't actually listen for that long anymore. We're too used to TikTok. Give us 30 second blurps. That's all we can actually deal with. But the teaching is central. And that's why it is also beautiful in Beit Marun that we have an entire week to stop and say, well, who are these men? Because it's not really about the men. It's about what is the Lord Jesus doing in his church, in his body, which is to teach, to communicate, to be the word. And then when we have learned and then when we're able to actually carry on a conversation with the hidden one, then we are disposed to receive the graces of the mysteries. Because then we are actually alert, we are awake. You know, how many times, we were discussing this last night, how many times now we have funerals? When we do a funeral, and I turn around for the Husoyo, and there's people just sitting there, sometimes with a cup of coffee in their hand, and their arm over the back pew, like staring at me like, what? And you think, well, what is going on here? What are you actually even doing in this building? Now, clearly they're there for an emotional thing for whoever has passed away. And that's wonderful in itself. But the lack of disposition and the unawareness, this is why actually up until the middle of the 20th century, for weddings and funerals, you didn't distribute communion at weddings and funerals. And the reason being is because you get everybody at weddings and funerals. Perhaps not always with a cup of coffee in the middle of the 20th century, but still the proverbial elbow over the back chair just kind of staring at the show. And again, what's so sad about this is it's the total lack of disposition. Again, it doesn't mean they're evil, it doesn't mean they're wicked, but they haven't been taught. They've no idea what's going on. So if you think of this in the terms, why I say it's one of the most attractive aspects of Beit Marun, of the Maronite Church, is because it recognizes the necessity of teaching. It recognizes the necessity of catechesis. It recognizes the necessity of the clarity of doctrine, of teaching. Now, that doesn't sound earth-shattering, but to take and to commemorate amongst those who have passed from this world, who are the priests in that sense? When you look through our anaphoras, we continually have reference to our teachers who have gone before us. This doesn't mean Mrs. Larkins in kindergarten. It means those who communicated to us in our generation that faith that they had received. That includes the parents who are meant to be teaching their children. That's the easiest students. They're just there 24 hours a day. And the communication of the faith, which is why our Lord elevated the union of man and woman to the elevation in the sacred crowning, in the matrimony, because you're meant to communicate. You are meant to be teachers in your own generation. And that's why it is a form of priesthood. It is a form. We speak about the man as being priest in his household by that sacred consecration of marriage. The centrality of teaching is so important because it allows us to converse with the hidden God. And our Lord's communication then in revealing himself in his incarnation has no other purpose than to bring you in on the eternal conversation of the hidden father. That, that's the gospel, that's it. And everything else flows from that. To listen, to hear. He who receives you, receives me. He who hears you, hears me. 
He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives my Father who sends me. That is the conversation. So when we look at teaching, it's not just drilling catechism into someone because they have to make their first communion. Or better, holding out the carrot, you know, in the old days when we used to make you wait till 12 for confirmation because it makes you go to catechism longer. This was just, these are ploys. This is terrible. Not to say it wasn't effective, but effective of what? You just have to grit your teeth and put up with it until you're 12 and then I'm out of here. The mentality, the idea of knowing that God speaks to us in his church is gloriously beautiful. When we just stop and think about it, to be ravished by the ability to know that the eternal one who makes the ground that I walk on do want more than just the ground you walk on, but to speak to you personally. You know, if we lived in a family where your children just came in, well, they all do this as teenagers, just come in, grab the food, grunt, and walk out of the house. But if your children always treated you that way, with no appreciation, nothing about it, barely acknowledging, assuming the house just belongs to them, and that really they don't participate in anything, you would find it hurtful, if not offensive. Because, of course, you are, and you see yourselves as being more than just a landlord with a pantry that they can ravage when they want. That is creation. A few weeks ago we had in the Masmurl. Look around you, all of creation is the temple of God. God creates these things, he allows, he gives us these things. We live in his house, we live in his temple. But his desire is not just an appreciation of the temple and the place that he's given us to live and to breathe. It's the desire to communicate with us personally, the same way every parent longs for that communication. And sometimes the best relationships are later on, when you're 80 and your little baby is 52, and now you have conversations that you've always wanted to have with this person. How many people I've met who finally said, now I know who my parents are and I love them as friends. That is a beautiful thing. But it begins in learning how to converse when you're little. That's why we used to have tables. And we used to have meals together. And you had to learn how to speak at a table. And how to converse around a table. And to speak about what you did at school. And what happened at work. It wasn't a gripe session. It was communication. To give and to take. To speak. To communicate. And to listen. Someone who just sits and just doesn't say anything, doesn't know how to converse. Someone who hogs the entire conversation doesn't know how to converse. That ability to give and to take and to receive is what the whole foundation of the life of prayer. Now this is a big elaboration, but I'm doing this because I want you to understand why this letter to Timothy is chosen. He starts out by talking about doctrine and teaching, and then he speaks about teaching again. Then he speaks about teaching again, and then he says about reading the scriptures. Now, reading the scriptures, he's not telling Timothy, go home and sit and read the gospels on your knees, privately. Because, of course, in the classical world, to read is always to be audible. And plus, nobody had private books. These are always enormously expensive things, manuscripts, but no printing. And so when he says to read the scriptures, he's saying in that public setting, you are meant in the body of Christ to nourish them, to teach them. What do these words mean? What is the saying here? And what is here? Because when they hear, they understand. And when they understand, they can converse. And when they converse, they love. And in the end, he says, this is what you have to do. And when he says, be a model of the flock, he doesn't say, oh, aren't you holy? He's saying, show them how to walk by knowing how to converse and knowing how to pray. And in doing that, show them the pathway. I've had this conversation with many, many families. We know statistically that the families whose children retain the faith is because those children were taught from the beginning that our identity is as Catholics. Doesn't mean we're holy, doesn't mean we're wonderful, doesn't mean we're the best Catholics around, but we know that we are Catholics. And those children, as that central identity, will retain that identity because it's part of what they received growing up. 
It's why we're always upset when we hear about families that break apart. Unfortunately, well, it's becoming more and more common, but it's always been the lesser numbers. Because the identity of my family, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my brothers and my sisters, this extension of family was part of the identity. It's why we've really had to work hard in the last hundred years to destroy family. You really have to work hard to make things become so profoundly unnatural that we lose those connections. And I mean, that seems to be what's happening these days on a family level. But it's the same thing with the faith. The faith is part of that identity. We tell stories about the grandparents. We tell stories about family events that the children could never possibly know because they didn't exist. But we tell those stories and they identify with them. And that is normal and that is beautiful. That is teaching. But we are supposed to also at the same time teaching them who is the Lord Jesus and the communication of the faith and why not only are we whatever name of our family, not only are we those people, but that we are also Catholics because we have heard the word of God. We have entered into the conversation with the unchanging one who desires to communicate with us. And when that identity is there, then you really have to become unnatural to break that identity in children. Yes, people will hit the skids, they may have problems, they go off to college, we fall into sin. All right, that's not the major problem. The major problem is, is do we land on our feet in the conversation and we find the unchanging God who is always communicating to us. Sin is not the end of the world. Permanent sin and living in sin, that's pretty catastrophic. What we're looking for is how we actually pray and reconnect and communicate. And so you have this phrase that I began the sermon with. Do not neglect the grace that you have received. He's telling Timothy, do not, because he goes on to elaborate, do not neglect the grace that you have received through the imposition of hands of the eldership, of the presbyterate. In other words, your, ordain, your ordination to the priesthood. Do not neglect that. And I would say to everyone who's married here, do not neglect that grace that you have received in the sacrament of matrimony. It makes you different. It makes you teachers. It makes you the voice of God to another generation within your household. It is a beautiful thing. And as Mainers, I have to go even further to say we really start, need to start making these distinctions in our heads. Because one, so many Mainers just are just shacked up. And two, so many even of Christians are just civilly married, which isn't a marriage. If you're consecrated, you get consecrated within a union of a consecration because you are sacred members of the body of Christ who are in that conversation with the unchanging one. And how many times in conversations when I mention to someone saying, oh, this person or that person's not married, and they go, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Then they get married at the civil, at the civil, they get married at the justice of the peace. That's not a marriage if you're consecrated. And it doesn't initiate your ability to teach, certainly not to be the voice of God within a household. It is not sacred in any way, except for commitment and devotion of friendship, which of course is beautiful, but it's not supernatural. And once Catholics have come to identify the nature with supernatural, we're done for. Because then why bother doing any of this? Why go to the altar? Why participate in the mysteries? If we're not receiving anything that is distinct, unique, and supernatural and transcendent, well then who cares? And that attitude of who cares is why all these parishes close one after another, after another, after another, because they have not known. And in not knowing because they have not been taught. This is why when Beit Marun turns around and celebrates an entire week, this will be exactly the same mass liturgically all this week, except for Thursday for the presentation. It's the same liturgy. Show them mercy, bring them compassion, and remember upon your altar in heaven all the good things they once offered you on earth in the divine mysteries. These are beautiful notions, profound concepts, profoundly Catholic. And so whenever you hear the word of teacher, 
In fact, we've chosen the anaphora of St. John Marin today. You will see in the intercession, it is about illumination of darkness. It is about light. It is about the gospel of the living. It is about conversation. And so the, the anaphora of St. John Marin, named after our first patriarch itself, himself, these are beautiful notions. And I want to leave you just with that understanding that when we pray for the priests who have gone before, it is a sign of our monastic and our sacerdotal aspect of being a church. We always say we're monastic. We say we're coming from St. Marin. It is a vision of apostolicity. It is a vision of that teaching. But to leave you also as a reflection and as an analogy, within your homes, you are consecrated also as teachers. In that sacrament of matrimony, you become the voice of God. And though it's not the priesthood in the way that we celebrate this week, it is still the very real eldership of communicating from one generation to another that beautiful conversation which brings life to us. That's the important thing to remember in this life of prayer and this life of conversation and this participation in the mysteries. And when we have done that, then we shall all look forward to the glorious day when we will all be there before the hidden face of the hidden Father, which will no longer be hidden. And he will be able to communicate to us face to face, openly, in that thing that we call beatitude in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Lord, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and from for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Hippolytus of Antioch. Remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. St. John Maron on page 897, 897. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord and Holy God and Father, through your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have prepared this spiritual and holy banquet for us. Accept these pure offerings and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to approach your sanctuary with pure hearts and clear consciences. Grant us the peace that your only Son gave to his holy disciples, so that we may give one another that same peace with a holy kiss. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. Peace. Love and faith, brothers and sisters, from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God of peace be with us. O oh Lord, may your peace and security and your love, grace, and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. We bow before you and ask that your merciful right hand rest upon your servants who are here before your majesty. Mark us with the sign of life that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. 
the love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and Father of mercies, Lord of creation, Lord of the universe, unsearchable God, you are the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, born of you and equal to you. He is the radiance of your glory, the image of your being, and by your power the maker of all. In him you created the world in your grace. In him we see you, and from him we receive your spirit. In him the mystery of the Trinity, hidden from all ages, was revealed. We praise and thank you with our mouths that have been blessed by your word, and cleanse with your forgiving his soul. Those who glorify you are countless. Kerubim and seraphim, thousands of spiritual beings standing before you, and myriads of fiery ranks serving your majesty. They sing triumphant hymns with harmonious voices. O Lord, although we are your weak and sinful children, make us worthy through the gift of your grace to sing with them and to proclaim. Exalted and glorious in your grace. Heaven and earth are the center of the great Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Most high and high, blessed be he who has the flesh of the Virgin Mary, accomplishing all things for our salvation. Kuri Ayele Song, Wabiyamo Hadokton Hashodi Lema Bed Haye. Pensame l'achma mida kori shanto barachu qadesh Waksoya bin talmida karo mara Sabachu lamehne kul khun Khunu denita fakhru dil Dakhlu faikun wakhlu saagiye Metachseu metihem Usoyon Chame wa choye Dal khaylam alamin Amin Chokanna halkusa Damzihwa min hamra Wa min mahaya Barakhu qadish Ya bint al-mita al-qadu mara Saab ishta wa mehne kul khun Khunu denita Dimon dila diya tiki khadato Dakhlu faikun wa khlaf saagiyen Mete sharu meti hab Usoyon Chame wa choye dan qaylam alameen Amin Do this in memory of me For whenever you gather in my name And eat this bread and drink this cup You remember my death and resurrection Until I come again you suffered and endured for us and your liberating and life-giving plan of salvation your miraculous incarnation your saving passion your life-giving cross and your life-giving death 
your solemn burial, your joyous resurrection, your ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of the Father, and your second coming when you shall reward all people according to their deeds. O Lord, have compassion and pour out your mercy upon all of us, that we may enjoy the gifts of your heavenly church. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. We that mercy, Lord. Reconciled. May those who hate find peace and those who are sad find joy. May those who grieve be consoled and those who are sick be healed. May those in distress find comfort and those who repent be humbled. May the prophets be remembered, the apostles honored and all the martyrs crowned. And may the confessors exult and all the angels rejoice. May your divinity be praised and your trinity be honored, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, the sacrifice, the memorial of your passion, crucifixion, death, and resurrection for your church throughout the world. She is founded upon your hope, remembers your salvation, and await your kingdom. We offer it for the bishops of the true faith, grant them the wisdom and knowledge that comes from you, and make them worthy to proclaim your kingdom. Especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. May all the shepherds of the church sanctify their days by caring in fear and in justice for your people that you have entrusted to them, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the priests and deacons here and everywhere who serve diligently and are vigilant over their flocks. May they receive their reward. Remember those who have taken vows of chastity and holiness, who keep their bodies and thoughts pure, that they may triumph in their efforts. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders who love you and all those whom you wish to govern us. Strengthen and assist them so that we may live in peace under their leadership. Crown them with true faith and good works. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders who love you on all those whom you wish to govern us.
strengthen and assist them so that they may live in peace under their leadership. Crown them with the true faith and good works. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the children of the Church, redeemed by your passion and given life by your death, for they share in your resurrection. Those who are far and those who are near, those who are weak and those who are strong, remember those who have presented these offerings upon your holy altar and accept them on your heavenly altar. Hear their just requests and in exchange for their earthly gifts, grant them the gifts of heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those whom we have remembered and those whom we have not. In your mercy, have compassion on them. Remember especially those in distress who experience hardships, the poor, the weak, and the grieving, those in exile, captives and prisoners, the oppressed, outcast, and dejected, <coughs> orphans and widows. Remember those bound by the chains of sin and subjected to various passions. Through your body and blood, may their sins be forgiven, their faults be pardoned, their weaknesses be cured, and their wounds be healed. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, in your great mercy, our fathers and patriarchs, the teachers of your holy church, who were pleasing to you from the beginning. By the glorious light of their teachings, they brought people back from the darkness of ignorance to the true light of the holy gospel, and they fought to preserve the integrity of the true faith. Through their holy prayers, grant peace to your churches, monasteries, and convents and put an end to wars and strife throughout the world. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all your saints, especially Mary, the holy and ever-Virgin Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and all who profess the Trinity in true faith. Through their holy prayers and petitions, look upon us with the eyes of compassion, and may your calming and pleasant face shine upon us. Make us worthy to share in their reward and their inheritance, and may their shadow be a shelter of protection for us on that fearful day of judgment. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, in the sweetness of your compassion, receive the souls of our brothers and sisters, the children of baptism, who have gone to you in the true faith from this world of darkness, especially those for whom this service is offered. May the mystery of your body and blood be a pledge of life for them, a fire that consumes all sins and a burning coal that destroys transgressions. In your mercy, grant them rest in the dwellings of light and joy in the heavenly Jerusalem. O lover of all people, grant us life, abundant blessings and mercy, and forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in all and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, it is now and shall be forever. Amen.
say something, Steve. We should be singing the ayah. secure. May your peace live within our hearts, your faith abide in our consciences, and your cross be a true sign of protection for your church. May our tongues proclaim your truth and repeat your holy prayer, and our lips pour forth glorious thanks to you, that with you we dare to call the Father Abba, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. O oh Lord, do not lead us, your lowly children, into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo elokolchunna. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O oh Lord, we have approached your holy altar, the source of divine gifts. May we share in your holy mysteries and join the assembly of those who glorify you, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy Father, one Holy Son, one, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, O God, Father of great mercy, and we praise and we raise praise and glorify you for having made us worthy of your holy banquet and of sharing in your life-giving mysteries. We implore you, do not condemn us on that fearful day, but deliver us from all shame and disgrace, so that we may join the assembly of your saints, so that with them and among them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el O Christ, the King of glory, we entrust our lives to you, knowing that you will take care of our needs. Help the elderly with your mighty power. Restrain the youth with your guidance. Nurture children and instruct them in your divine teaching. And sign each one of us with your victorious cross. To you be glory with your Father and your Holy Spirit, 
now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen.